Have you ever been reading one of those whodunit novels or gone to a movie that's a whodunit and you're trying desperately to figure out who done it? And then in the last couple of chapters or right near the end of the movie, the author introduces a whole new character and turns out they done it. I hate when that happens because I spent the whole movie trying to figure out who it was and I didn't even know who it was because they didn't even tell me who it was until the very end. Well, John kind of does the same thing to us in his gospel. He introduces this person, Mary Magdalene, and he doesn't even tell us her name until the 19th chapter. And here she is figured very prominently in this resurrection story. Well, so I want to spend a little bit of time this morning talking about this Mary Magdalene and, and who she was. Now, I know you're saying to yourself, Pastor Keith, it's Easter Sunday. This is the most important Sunday of the year. This is your most important sermon. You're supposed to talk about Jesus. What's the matter with you? Well, I figure you've heard all those other Easter sermons. So at, for a change, I thought I'd do something a little different. I'm going to have to get some leashes for these guys. <laughs> well, I want to talk about Mary Magdalene because I think she's important for us to understand. You see, John focuses his resurrection story on three individuals. Peter, the disciple who Jesus loved, or John, and this Mary Magdalene. So I want to focus a little bit on her this morning, and maybe we'll learn something we didn't know before. So who was Mary Magdalene? Uh, most of the people in the Bible don't have a last name. So she must be special because she's got one. Well, no. Mary Magdalene means, Magdalene means a woman of Magdala. We believe that Magdala was a port city in Israel on the Mediterranean. And at some point in her life, she lived there. It doesn't necessarily mean she was born there or she came from there, but it means she held residence in that town at some point. Well, the scholars disagree a lot on Mary Magdalene's history and who she was and the places that she appears in the Bible, especially in John, because he doesn't even give us, our, give us her last name until the 19th chapter. But I think there are some clues about who she is, and I think she appears in the gospel earlier. You see, I think that she may very well be that same Mary from Bethany, Martha's sister, Lazarus' sister, the one whom Jesus raised from the dead. I think she may very well be the woman in chapter 8 who's caught in adultery, that they bring before Jesus and say, Moses' law says we're supposed to stone such women, Jesus. What do you say? And after thinking about it for a while, Jesus says, all right, whoever among you has not yet sinned can go ahead and throw that first rock at her. Now, the reason that I believe this is that because in several of the de depictions in pictures of Mary in the early church, she appears with her hair down. Being the great theological scholar that I am, I know that in first century Israel, women always wore their hair up in public unless they were one of those women of ill repute. And I think it's especially amazing that Mary would appear in pictures with her hair down even in the churches that we've excavated from the second and third century. It's likely that she was the one who came in and broke open the bottle of perfume and, and prepared Jesus unknowingly for his burial by putting the perfume on his feet and on his head, crying and wiping his feet with her tears and her hair. It's likely that she was in Jerusalem when the triumphant entry happened, with the palm branches and all the commotion, she probably experienced that and some of Jesus' teaching in the last week of his life. She was probably there and heard when the voice came from heaven that said, my good and faithful son, showing God's approval. She probably 
was there in the upper room because the Bible tells us that there were some women who traveled in the company of the disciples preparing food for them and taking care of them. She may even have been in the upper room and witnessed the foot washing and the first communion as Jesus shared it with his disciples. She may have watched Judas run away to betray him. I'm sure that she heard about the trial that happened and all the false charges that were brought against him. And John tells us that she and Mary's mother and the disciple Jesus loved stood and watched as Jesus was crucified. And then she waited over the Sabbath to care for him. Now, in first century Israel, they followed, as they do today, the Sabbath laws. Sabbath begins at sundown on Friday evening and doesn't end until sundown on Saturday evening. And they weren't allowed to do anything. You couldn't cook any food. You couldn't do any chores. Not only just the Jewish people, but their servants and all of their animals as well. And so Saturday night came and it was too dark to go to the tomb. So at Dawn's first light on Sunday morning, as soon as she was able to, she went to the tomb to care for Jesus' body. Well, I tell you, there's one thing that we do know about Mary Magdalene. We know that Jesus changed her life. In the Gospel of Luke, it says, There were also some women in their company who had been healed of various evil afflictions and illnesses. Mary, the one called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Now, it's difficult for us in our third millennium uh, Western civilization mindset to deal with the whole idea of demons. Mostly, we have taken a lot of these things that we're thinking of. We're thinking? I was an English major were thought of as demon possession, and we've called them a particular psychological illness. But in first century Israel, they didn't have that kind of medical sophistication. So when someone was acting very strangely, they figured that person had a demon. And so whether Jesus cast seven demons out of her or cured her, her of seven different kinds of psychological ailments, it was an amazing event for her. And he changed her life in such a way that she sought to care for Jesus. In the only way that she knew how. You see, his body was left over the weekend. And they didn't have embalming practices like we do. And so the custom in that day was as soon as the person was laid to rest, they would cover the body with spices to keep down the smell. And I'm sure that she was very distraught that she hadn't had the opportunity to do that yet. So she went as early as she could to care for Jesus' body. And then she gets to the tomb, and his body is missing. Can't find him. No idea where he is. I'm sure the first thing that went across her mind was those rotten Romans. They, they want to destroy his image so much that they won't even let us care for his body appropriately. And so she ran to get the disciples. You see, because Mary didn't get the whole picture. She was so distraught at the loss of this man that she loved, who had changed her life, that she just fell apart. She went to get Peter and John, and, and they ran to the tomb. Now, I had this crazy professor in seminary. I may have told you this before. He didn't believe that the apostle John wrote the gospel of John. He was convinced that Lazarus wrote the gospel of John, and he had two particular reasons. One was when Jesus came to Lazarus' tomb, and he stopped out front, and the Bible says Jesus wept, and all of the people around said, Look how much he loved him. And the writer of John refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. He said the second uh, proof that Lazarus was the one who wrote John's gospel was at the end when they were running to the tomb, Peter and this disciple that Jesus loved, John got there first, but he stopped. He didn't go in and he said, if you had been in the tomb for four days, would you be rushing into another one? 
Well, I think it's all a very nice theological exercise, but I'm sure that John wrote the gospel because John was a very humble man. He didn't cite his own experiences by name because he wanted you to focus on Jesus in the gospel and not him. So John and Peter get to the tomb and they go inside and they see the burial cloths wadded up on the floor, except for, John says, the kerchief. Well, being the astute theological scholar that I am, I looked this up, and I discovered that in the burial practices of the first century Jews, they put over the face of the deceased a kerchief. It was usually prepared especially for the individual. It may have been especially embroidered. It was probably given as a gift earlier in life by someone that they loved very much, most probably their mother. And so if the Roman soldiers had come and just taken Jesus' body away, they would have rolled that all up with the rest of the cloths and thrown them on the ground. And yet this cloth was taken and folded very carefully and set where Jesus' head had laid. I think that's a, a clue to not only us, but also to Peter and John that it was Jesus who folded that special cloth that his mother had made for him up and left it there for them to find. Because when they saw it, they put it all together. You see, these disciples were kind of a bunch of bumpkin idiots, and Jesus kept telling them, this is what's going to happen, this is what's going to happen, and they could never figure it out until they went in the tomb, found it empty, and saw the kerchief, and it all came together. All the stuff that he had told them, all the miracles that he had done, they finally figured it out. And they rejoiced, and they went back to tell the rest of the disciples. But not Mary. Mary didn't get the whole picture. She didn't figure it out. Well, I can almost hear you asking yourself, why is he talking about this Mary? Why is she so important? Well, I wanted to talk to you about Mary this morning because I think Mary is just like us. Mary shows us how lost we are without Jesus. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. They took my master, she said, and, they, and I don't know where they've put him. She was so lost in her sorrow and disillusionment that she couldn't even see Jesus standing right in front of her. I don't know about you, but I've been in similar situations. I'm so lost in my sorrow and disillusionment or so busy with the tasks of life that Jesus is standing right in front of me and I don't even see him. Could be someone who needs my help. Could be someone who's there to help me. But whoever it is that represents Jesus for me, I'm so busy or so messed up or so whatever that I don't even see him right in front of me. And just like Mary, there are times when we don't even recognize our Savior. She turned away and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't even recognize him. There are times in our lives when God is right there with us. And we don't even see him. You, you probably see him in hindsight. That time where you were alone or sad or hurting and you were helped through it, but you don't know why. You can look back and see that Jesus was right there, even though you didn't even recognize him. And then Jesus says to her, Mary. And he says also something to her very strange. Don't cling to me. Don't cling to me. Why not? You're alive, Jesus. It's so wonderful to see you. Let's go get lunch. Let's go do a movie or something. He says, no, 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 no. There's much more important things to do. I want you to go tell them I'm alive. And when Mary finally realizes who it is, she has to go 
tell somebody. You see, I believe that Mary is the first evangelist. I believe that she's referred to as Mary of Magdala, not only because she was born there or from there, I think that after Christ's resurrection, she went to Magdala to tell everyone about him. There's some historical artifacts that would lead us to believe that there was a woman named Mary who started the church in Magdala. You see, she was so touched by her experience with this man who saved her and rose from the dead that she had to go and tell somebody about it. I'm hoping this morning that all of you have had a similar kind of experience with your Savior, so much so that you feel like you have to tell somebody about it. Well, then comes the fateful question at the end of every sermon. So what? That's a very interesting story about Mary. Keith, thank you for sharing that with us. So what? Well, the so what of this sermon is that I believe that Jesus asks us the same question that he asked Mary. Who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? Because I believe we're all looking for some kind of a Savior, but I don't know if we're all looking for the same kind of a Savior. I think some of us are looking for a Savior that's kind of like a Santa Claus, who will bring us all the wonderful things that we ever wanted. Dear Lord, please bring me a Porsche. A Santa Claus God who who will just bless us with gifts. I think there are some of us who are looking for a butler Savior. Someone who will take care of all the little things in life that we don't really want to take care of. Okay, Jesus, you just come here and and you take care of these problems in my life because I'm really busy with all this stuff over here. And if you'll take care of that, then I can take care of this and everything will be okie dokie. Some people aren't looking for a Santa Claus or a butler. Some people are looking for a bodyguard savior. Jesus, help me. They're out to get me. Jesus, help me. I'm hurting. Jesus, help me. I'm sick. But Jesus isn't just Santa Claus or a butler or a bodyguard. Jesus is a Savior who is there to attend to every need that we have. Mostly our need for salvation. This man who hung on the cross and died for our sins didn't just die for our sins. He rose from the dead proving his power over death. And then he said to us, in the same way that I rose from the dead, you have the power over death as well. So I want to ask you to contemplate a question this Easter Sunday. Who are you looking for? Because if you've been looking for Santa Claus or a butler or a bodyguard, you're probably disappointed in Jesus. Ask yourself, who am I looking for? Because when you discover the Jesus of the Bible, the one who rose from the dead to give you power over death, the one who said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, more life than you ever expected you would ever have, when you find that Savior, your life will never